started. So today our um, first topic will be conservative systems, which continues our discussion of um, what can happen in two-dimensional phase spaces. But these conservative systems have a little extra structure to them that makes them do some kind of remarkable things that you wouldn't see in typical dynamical systems. So <clears throat> let's uh, begin with the conservative systems that you're probably most familiar with, which have to do with classical mechanics. So <clears throat> let's consider a um, mechanical system with just one degree of freedom. Governed by Newton's law. So we're writing F equals MA, but we'll write it in this form. MX double dot is a function of x, so that is the force. Think of a particle of mass m, and the force on the particle only depends on position x. And we'll conveniently write it as minus the derivative of a potential, um, potential energy, really. And so the thing that you're supposed to be noticing here is the specific form of f. f is independent of both time and velocity. So notice that. This, this is, um, you know, in physical language, we could say there's no damping of any kind, and there's no external driving, no time-dependent driving. Actually, I guess there could be constant driving, but um, nothing that depends on time. So we're assuming no damping or external drive. And then under those conditions, uh, not too surprisingly, there's a conserved quantity, which people call the, the energy, the kinetic plus potential energy. So these assumptions, uh, the energy E, which is a half m x dot squared, so that's the old kinetic energy, a half m v squared in the usual notation, plus potential energy v of x is conserved. And the way to see this, well, there's a few ways you could see it, but um, a trick that's nice to know is when you have a force equation and you're looking for a conserved quantity, it's often a good idea to multiply both sides by x dot and then stare at it. So here a little proof of this statement that energy is conserved is you go mx double dot times x dot plus uh, bringing the dv dx to the other side. So then we'd have um, dv dx x dot the whole thing was equal to zero multiplying by x dot, it's still equal to zero after I bring the dv dx to the other side. And then you just stare at the left-hand side of this and recognize it's a perfect derivative. That is, this is equal to d dt of m x dot squared over 2 plus v of x of t. Right? I mean, think about it with the chain rule. Remember, we're not differentiating with respect to x or with respect to x dot. We're differentiating with respect to t. So when you differentiate this, you'll get m 2x dot over 2, but then there's a chain rule term, x double dot. And likewise here, you would get v prime of x, x dot, which is exactly what we see above. So this whole thing is equal to 0, which tells us that the quantity inside must be independent of time. That is to say, E is constant. 
And the way we like to say it is E is constant on trajectories, meaning that as you follow uh, the, a trajectory of the dynamical system, the value of this function E will not change, even though the point is moving around in state space. Okay, so no real big surprise there. You already knew that energy would be conserved for this kind of system, but this is a nice, easy way to see that. Now, um, when we speak about conservative systems, we also want to include examples more general than this, like there are conservative systems that sometimes arise in biology or um, You'll do a homework problem about a little model of a glider, an airplane. You know, like as a kid, you may have played with balsa wood glider where you throw it and it flies for a while before it crashes into somebody's head or into a tree. Uh, and so that turns out under, you know, a certain simplified model of its dynamics will be a conservative system, but the conserved quantity there doesn't have a simple interpretation as energy. It's something else. Um, so that will be on the homework. You'll, you, you may enjoy that little problem. But anyway, so more generally than these conservative systems, um, we want to say what it means for x dot equals f of x to be conservative. Um, well, actually, maybe I should say it this way. Uh, x dot equals f of x has a conserved quantity. Well, um, let's say it this way. F is conservative if it has a conserved quantity, or sometimes called a constant of motion, or a first integral. There are various names for this thing. A, a let's call it conserved quantity um, that, in keeping with the idea of energy, I'll still write it as E, although it doesn't have to be energy. E is a function of the state x. Um, so a conserved quantity means it's a, a continuous real-valued function. that is this E, is a continuous real valued function that is constant on trajectories. So in other words, when you take the time derivative of it, you'll get zero. And um, Okay, so that's really all. Let me give you an example, not of a more general one, but let's just talk about a, what we can say about conservative mechanical systems. Um, later in the course, we'll do things that aren't strictly mechanical. Is there any question so far? Okay. Um, there is one technical thing I probably should say just for the record, which um, I don't want to get mired in, but... The, the official definition of a conservative system would have one more caveat, which is um, that the function E this always causes a big discussion, which I'm reluctant to get into. Um, but anyway, let's require that this function E is not identically constant on any open set. So, all right, why would you want something like that? I mean, some people are already thinking, what's an open set? I didn't take topology, or I didn't take analysis, so I don't really know what you're talking about. Uh, so there's that aspect of what makes this confusing for some people, depending on their background. Um, here's a simple reason why we want something like this. Suppose you, you would allow a function that was just identically constant on the whole phase space, like, say, um, just to be silly about it, something like E 
the function e of x, which is identically equal to 17, that would be a conserved quantity if I didn't have a requirement like this. Because it is true that this is a continuous function. It's real valued. It is constant on trajectories. If I differentiate it, I get 0. But it's kind of a stupid thing to remark because, you know, duh, of course it's constant on trajectories. But it's not informative because under that way of thinking, every system would be conservative because they all conserve the number 17. Right? So that's not what you mean. You don't want something trivial like this. Now, that would say we don't want to allow E to be constant on the whole phase space. But why this bit about constant on open sets or non-constant on open sets? Um, how about I just refer you to look me in the book for the explanation for that? Uh, I don't. I want to get into something a little more substantive. Yes. So other than trivial examples like that, is there only one quantity? The question was, other than trivial examples like this, is there only one conserved quantity for a given conservative system? Not necessarily. No, there could be more than one. But if we have one, then we'll say it's conservative, or at least one. Most systems don't have any. Right? I mean, the typical thing is that there will be no conserved quantities. But um, special systems may have one or more. OK. So um, let's do an easy example or two. Well, otherwise, this would be a conserved quantity for every system. That's you know silly. There are better reasons than this, but let me refer you to the book. If you're really interested, I could say more some other time. But okay, so here's a more interesting example. Let's um, talk about a particle in a double well potential. So by that, I mean, let's consider a uh, potential energy function that has a form something like this, minus a half x squared plus a quarter x to the fourth. So double well, the name comes from, if you draw the graph of v of x, as a function of x, it looks like that, right? Because the negative a half x squared near x equals 0 um, accounts for this sort of downward-looking parabola. And then for larger x, it starts to look like x to the fourth. And then in between, it does this. So you have these two local mins. In fact, you could calculate. The reason I have the 1 half and the 1 quarter built in there is that uh, the local minima have been chosen for simplicity to be at 1 and negative 1. And so a particle that was moving around in here would be happy to sit at the bottom of either of those uh, wells. OK, and so our governing equation, and again, in the interest of simplicity, let's not carry around the parameter for the mass. We'll just set it equal to 1. Or if you prefer, you could rescale time to make it equal to 1. Um, our differential equation will be x double dot is minus dv dx, which um, for this v will give us x minus x cubed. So there's a nice nonlinear system. At, at the moment, it's second order, of course. And, and then we're going to rewrite it as a pair of first order equations. So let's let x dot equals y, as we usually do. And then y dot um, would be x double dot, which is x minus x cubed. So 
So there's our 2D system. And now we want to analyze it the way we did in the previous lecture where we look at fixed points and classify them using their Jacobian. Um, so here are the Jacobian matrix, which you'll remember is dx dot dx, dx dot dy, dy dot dx, dy dot dy. Or I should be saying partial, but whatever. So here that would be 0, 1, um, 1 minus 3x squared, and 0. And we want to evaluate that at the fixed points, which you can see for a fixed point, we'll need y equals 0 and x. Well, actually, x, you know, that, that term factors as x, 1 minus x squared. That equals 0 when either x is 0 or x is plus or minus 1. And so we have three fixed points. There's first the fixed point at x star, y star equals 0, 0, which then plugging in, you'd get the Jacobian, um, calling it A. That would be 0, 1, 1, 0. And uh, recognize that that has a, well, a trace of 0 and a determinant of negative 1. So this gives us a saddle. from our old classification like this. In the, um, there's delta, here's tau. This point is, you know, somewhere over there. That's in the saddle world. So we have a saddle at the origin. And then we know that um, when the linearization predicts a saddle, it really is a saddle for the nonlinear system. So, OK, good, we believe that. But now let's look at the other pair of points. We might as well consider them at the same time. Um, if we look at x star, y star is plus or minus 1, comma, 0, then um, when we put that into A, we'll get 0, 1. Um, 1 minus 3 is negative 2, 0. And So this has a trace of 0, but a determinant of positive 2. Which places us somewhere like that. So according to the linearization, we would have a center. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Remember, you're supposed to, when you hear a center, according to the linearization, that alarm goes off that the linearization might be lying. And so you have to think about this. Is it really a center for the nonlinear system? Um, it turns out here, yes, it is. That because in um, a system like this where there's a conserved energy, we'll be able to show that this really is a center for the nonlinear system as well. And so I want to go into that argument with a little bit of care. Um, so in fact, these points, um, plus and minus 1, 0, are true, so to speak, nonlinear centers. Um, and really, why? Because of conservation of energy. So let's see how that works. Um, well, all right, so what is the energy? We said that it'd be a half, you know, it's the kinetic energy plus potential. 
So the energy here would be a half, we set m equal to 1, and the x dot we're calling y. So this term, a half y squared, would be the kinetic energy. That's really a half mv squared. And then there's plus the potential energy v of x, which for us we said was that thing with the 1 quarter and the 1 half. That's, I guess, oh, there it is down there. So plus, no, actually, um, minus 1 half x squared. plus one-fourth x to the fourth. This thing is constant on trajectories. And so to draw the trajectories, one way you could think about it is just ask, what do curves where this thing equals a constant look like? That is, those are curves in the xy plane, but, but what's their appearance? Um, not totally obvious. But uh, they are typically closed curves. Um, these represent closed curves. And well, how can we see that? So let's think about that a little bit. Um, maybe I'll, I'll try to convince you that these are closed curves and that therefore the center really is a center for the full system um, and not a spiral. But first let me look at this a different way. I think you'll find this helpful. Um, I mean here, here's what we'll, we'll get as the phase portrait um, and then we'll try to see why these really are closed curves. So here's x, here's y. And we said that there's a saddle at the origin. And we have um, centers at 1 and negative 1 that are about to be proven to be nonlinear centers momentarily. But for now, let's just um, observe that suppose x and y are both small to see what's going on near the origin. So if x and y are both small, you could neglect the x to the fourth term compared to the x squared term. And then we just have something of the form y squared minus x squared equals a constant, which you recognize as the equation for um, a hyperbola, which is not surprising. There's a saddle point at the origin. So we have, um, you know, you could check that the asymptotes will look like that, coming out at 45 degree angles close to the origin. And then nearby, we have hyperbolic looking stuff going on. And we should think about which way are the arrows going. So we can see which way the arrows go by looking at x dot equals y. That's enough information right there. x dot equals y. Um, y dot is x minus x cubed tells us that when y is positive, x dot is positive. So that means like up here in the upper half plane, y is positive. Um, so if x dot is positive, that means we're moving to the right. All these trajectories are going that way with arrows pointing to the right. And um, in the lower half plane, the opposite, they're going to the left like this. Here, going to the right, so that's going in, and this is going in, but like so. Okay, so that's the local phase portrait near the origin. Now, near the other point, um, the plus or minus 1 on the x-axis, uh, you could check. I think they're going to turn out to be nearly circular orbits, at least close enough by. Not po Actually, I'm not sure that they're strictly circular. They could be elliptical, whatever, but they're closed. And you can see by the direction of the neighboring um, arrows, or by the argument we just made, that they're going like that. And actually, if we, um, 
well, maybe I'll just tell you what the answer is going to come out to be. W one can show that what really happens is, oh, actually, OK, let's show a few more techniques for thinking about this. Here's another point we could make. Let's look at where y dot is equal to 0, just on its own, y dot equals 0. So that is, y dot equals 0 means no y component of velocity. And so that would mean we're moving horizontally at such a place. And so that occurs everywhere, you know, if either x equals 0, we uh, move horizontally like that, or here we move horizontally like this to the left. But also, if x is plus 1, that is along um, this vertical line, we're also, again, moving horizontally. I'm not being careful about the length of the arrows. I'm just showing the direction. Actually, they would have different length, but let's ignore that for now. And then similarly over here, um, it's the same kind of argument. They're going horizontally. Uh, what else? Then we could also ask, where is the vector field vertical? That would be where x dot is 0. And that's going to happen on the places where y is 0, that is to say, on the x-axis. So you can check that we're going vertically down over here and vertically up over here. That's because at large x, um, x minus x cubed will be negative if x is large and positive, and it'll be positive if x is large and negative. OK, so we're getting a lot of information. And, and now, just to fill in the rest of the phase portrait, this is what it's going to look like. There'll be a trajectory of this type that comes around, goes through here horizontally, comes in and miraculously lands right on that stable manifold of the saddle. And you can also observe that this equation has a lot of symmetry to it. It has symmetry of y goes to minus y. It also has symmetry of x goes to minus x. And so that means that the picture, you know, the top part of the picture will be symmetric to the bottom part, and the left will be symmetric to the right. So given this, we can um, draw its mirror image. I'll try to draw it reasonably accurately like that. And then there's another symmetric part of it over here, you know, something like this. And then inside that, that curve, then we just have closed curves, you know, sort of like this or like this. And then outside, we have these big, um, sort of look like a peanut, don't they? With the shell still on it. That is, they kind of go like this. And then horizontal, go horizontal again, vertical. And then draw the symmetric bottom of that. OK. So that's qualitatively what the phase portrait turns out to look like. And um, let's try to understand physically what it's saying. Uh, by the way, this one orbit here, or the really two, that I, I said, you know, kind of miraculously goes right into the saddle. Maybe I'll highlight that with this red or orange chalk, because um, this is a special one worth commenting on. That, that guy that I just drew in in orange, we're going to call a homoclinic orbit. That's a kind of fancy name. That's what it's called. Homoclinic orbit or homoclinic trajectory is the term that gets used. Um, I'll try to think about it. Any Latin scholars? Homo, the same. Clinic, besides the place where you go when you're sick. Um, clinic. Like if I'm in, oh, what are you doing with your hand? A slope, kind of like an incline or a decline. Right, so if you're inclined to something, or if you're homoclinic, you're kind of inclined to go back to the same point, is the idea. That is, um, a trajectory that starts at a fixed point and ends up at the same fixed point, or approaches the same fixed point. That's a homoclinic orbit. 
So, so to speak, starts, it doesn't really start there because as you know, it doesn't, strictly speaking, touch that point. But let's say, um, I don't know, make it, yeah. okay, loosely speaking, starts and ends at the same fixed point. So that's not really right. What we really should say is it approaches a certain fixed point as time goes to infinity, and it also approaches that same fixed point as time goes back to negative infinity. That would be, that would be correct to say it like that. OK, so anyway, we've got that homoclinic orbit. And then uh, observe that it is not periodic. That is, it, if you start here near the origin, you'll go around and then asymptotically approach the origin. But that's it. You don't go around and around. Whereas all the other trajectories are periodic, anywhere else you start, you'll just go around and around in a loop forever. You could think of it kind of as a periodic orbit with the period being infinitely long. But it's better to not think of it that way. It's just, um, it's, it is what it is. It's a homoclinic orbit. But what does it mean? So let's now try to talk about the physics of this for a second. Um, I'm sure you can already guess what's happening. That is, think about it you know, in a physical picture. Here's the, the double well. Anyone want to indicate what the homoclinic orbit would look like if I were a particle uh, moving around according to a homoclinic orbit? What would the particle do? Do you know? Uh, OK, you could go right there. You're doing some. Yeah, yes, you please with the nice red shirt. Tell us, tell us with your finger. You were doing something, but now you speak. Yes, it goes, oh, wait a second, did it go back? What did it do? OK, now you're doing something in front with the hockey hat. You, want it, you went like this. Did you mean it? You don't mean that. No, what do you mean? I mean, it would just stay in the well, like whatever side it can. It's not going to go over the top. Won't go over the top. Good. What will it do, though? It'll, it'll be, it's this, very, it's this amazing thing where it will start exactly at this energy level. It'll go down, picking up speed, going, slowing down, and then gracefully stopping exactly on the top. And not rolling back and not going over the top. Right? Just taking infinitely long to, to approach this point without falling backward or going over the top. That is, it's, you gotta get it just right to get a homoclinic orbit. Other orbits, um, I mean, maybe we should talk about the more typical ones. That is, um, a more typical orbit would say start at this energy level. It would go down, come up to the same energy. Because, of course, these places where it's going to turn around are where the kinetic energy is zero, right? That's how I'm thinking of this. That there's a certain potential energy initially, go down, come up to that same height, turn around, go back. So something like this that does small oscillations in one well that's physically what's going, you know, indicated by this kind of little closed orbit. Whereas these big peanut-shaped ones are the ones that have so much energy that they can go barreling over the top. They sample both wells and then turn around and go back. And so these kind of oscillations are represented by these big outer orbits. And as we said, the homoclinic orbit is the dividing line between the two types where you're stuck in one well or you're sampling both. The homoclinic orbit tries to sample but doesn't go over the top. Does that make sense? So you can think of it as a kind of dividing case. Now, um, another way of looking at the same problem which I think may help convince you if you have any doubt that these curves are closed, is to look at what people call an energy surface, which would be a um, drawing a three-dimensional picture where we have the surface E as a function of x and y. We're drawing the graph of this function in three dimensions. So let us... Um, try our three-dimensional drawing skill here. I uh, want to draw a picture where the 
I'm going to use the third dimension will represent the energy going up. And then there will be an x-axis going sideways. And finally, there's going to be a y-axis going into the board, which I'll try to indicate like that. You know what I mean, I hope. That is, really, y is perpendicular to the board, but I can't draw that too well. So now, to draw the graph of this, um, well, let me try and see if you get it. Um, okay, actually, can I try to convey to you what it's going to look like? So um, a, when my kids were little, they used to have these special pajamas that had feet. And so it's going to look like that. It's going to have two legs, but it will have these kind of bulby things at the bottom where the feet go. Watch this. All right. Looks about like so. Um, here's where you would put the stubby little feet. Uh, this is the crotch. And then if a, a you know, level set through there would look like this. And then above the, the contours you know, are these peanut-shaped uh, contours. And that would be what we have up here on the top. Whoops. Yeah, that's about right. Well, actually, I can see that because that's at the top. So I'm, does that look like a surface, kind of? You see what I'm trying to show, right? And so um, now the trajectories don't act. OK, this is a common misunderstanding. A lot of people want to draw the trajectories moving around on this surface. They're not doing that. Remember, the trajectories live in the xy plane. So the trajectories are not up here on the surface. They're down here. So just taking a little license for visibility, I'll, I'll draw the xy plane down here. Um, though really, you recognize that, in fact, where is the xy plane? It would be going through the crotch, wouldn't it? Because it's at a height of energy of 0, and the energy would be 0 when x and y are both 0. So this point is at energy level 0, so, but I don't want to attempt to draw that plane going through there. So drawing the plane a little below, um, you can see one nice thing, though. Where, so if the trajectories are down here in the xy plane, to get them, what you do is take all these level sets and just push them all down onto the xy plane. Right? Clear? That is, here's the, the local mins. They will project down to just being points. And then a level set like this will project down to give you, you know, a closed curve like that. And then this higher level, the homoclinic orbit, would project down to here. That gives us these figure eight shaped objects. Uh, this goes down to here. All right, I didn't do both sides, but whatever. Whoa. That looks terrible, but OK, sorry. <laughs> this, this is a little bit distorted over here. Somebody stepped on my peanut. <laughs> ah, it cracked. No, OK. Yeah, whatever, come on, it's getting worse. <laughs> but you, you get what I'm trying to show. So yeah, right. So you're racing around down here in the xy plane, but you can sort of think of what energy level you'd be at. Or another way you could do it, actually, if you want to think of the trajectories moving on the energy surface, they could do that, but then they have to stay at constant height. Right? They don't go down or up. They're, they're at a constant height because E is conserved. So you can think of it that way. But the thing you must not do is think of the particle rolling down the energy surface into the well. That's wrong. It's not doing that. It's staying at a constant E. You can think of it this way, like we did earlier, 
But there I'm just drawing V as a function of X. I'm not actually drawing the energy surface in the XY space. They're, they're different pictures and it's easy to get mixed up. Th this is a funny picture where you're kind of thinking, you're actually, if you, if you think about it carefully, you're really doing a confusing thing when you draw this picture. In physics, they always draw this picture, right? They draw the particle moving in the well, and they're implicitly thinking of gravity going down and a physical ball moving in a well going down under gravity. But realize there's no gravity in this problem. We're just using our, right? There's no gravity. This was just a particle with a weird spring acting on it. Um, the X, you know, that cubic restoring force. So this is just using our physical intuition about things rolling around under gravity, but it's really not the correct physical picture. Okay, anyway, whatever. It's still good for intuition. So let's leave that example, I think. Um, is there any question about it before we completely leave it? Yes? Sorry, I didn't hear the beginning. Oh, I wrote the wrong thing, didn't I? Yes, thank you. All right, let's correct that. Feel free when I make a mistake like that. Tell me sooner. There was uh, <laughs> no need to hold off. Right, that should be x to the fourth. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Yes? Yeah. Yes, right. E is constant on contours. Those are not open sets. So for people who need reminding, an open set in the plane, you know, let's just talk about a point in the plane. Uh, or, or let's say here's a region in the plane, is, and there's a point. Is this region an open set? The test is pick a point. It, if it's an open set, then any point in the region must be um, must have the property that there's a small, let's say, epsilon size disk around that point, which remains entirely inside the region. Okay, that is, if if it has that sort of, it's the generalization of an open interval, where an open interval you think doesn't include its endpoints, so that means that any point in the interval you can draw another little tiny interval around it that stays completely in the original interval. So this is a generalization of this to higher dimensions, where now you use a little open disk around um, the point. If that disk lies inside this region, that's said to be an open region. And so a curve is not an open region in the plane, because if I try to put a little disk around a point on the curve, obviously the disk is hanging off the side and is not completely contained inside the curve. OK, so, so these, these are perfectly allowable. The real reason that we want this condition about E not constant on open sets is um, it comes in handy when we're trying to prove a certain theorem, which is that conservative systems can't have any attracting fixed points. That's uh, the theorem I want to refer you to. I mean, you would believe that, probably, intuitively, that there are no asymptotically stable fixed points in a conservative system no attracting fixed points. And um, that is, in the case of two dimensions, they're going to always be centers or saddles. Like here, we saw a cent pair of centers and a saddle. This is very typical, that those are what the fixed points look like. You can't have something like a stable node in a conservative system. And you could ask, well, why not? So suppose you did. I'm, I'm just being loose here. Check the book for a more careful discussion. But if I had a stable node, the problem is that um, you know, within some open set around that stable node, all the trajectories would go to asymptotically approach that, that node. And so what we're using is the idea that the basin of attraction, as it's called, that is the set of all initial conditions that lead, whose trajectories then lead to this point, the basin of this point will be an open set. And on that set, um, if E is constant, that will mean every point in this open set has the same level of E. And so that will cause a problem. I mean, by saying we don't allow that, we don't allow, levels, uh, we don't allow E to be constant on any open set, we're then able to show that um, you can't have things like stable nodes or stable spirals in a um, conservative system. So that's where we end up using that condition. 
Did you have a question? Did you guys want to talk about something? You're okay? Or something I might have fouled up? Yeah, this this energy equation, this you can think of, and you know, if you want, as a half m x dot squared, except that the m is one and the x dot is called y, and then this is plus v of x. That's all this stuff. Where the v was defined to be minus a half x squared plus one fourth x to the fourth. Yes. Anything else? Okay. So enough about this one. Now. Um, let me make a more general statement about nonlinear centers, which um, here we, by explicitly calculating the energy, could convince ourselves that these centers were true nonlinear centers. But um, we could make a more general statement than that. So um, So here's the, the theorem. I'm not going to give a real proof, but I'll try to give the idea of the proof. So it's a theorem about nonlinear centers and two-dimensional conservative systems. And so um, just to set it up, suppose we've got uh, x dot equals f of x as our system, and this is conservative. And let's suppose that our f is continuously differentiable, which, you know, is our standard assumption that gives us existence and uniqueness of solutions. Uh, and let's suppose that, well, we're assuming that x lives in R2. So we're in the two-dimensional plane. We've got E is a conserved quantity. And here's a technicality that we actually really need which is that this x star is not just a fixed point, it's an isolated fixed point. By that, I mean that there are no other fixed points in its immediate vicinity. More, more specifically, what I mean is that if I take x star, it's possible to draw an epsilon ball around it an epsilon disk, such that there are no other fixed points inside this disk. There's just x star. So like you don't have a, a sequence of fixed points asymptotically approaching this fixed point. Yes? So, so, like so um, counterexample, I mean, if you want to know what a non-isolated fixed point would look like, certainly if you had a whole line of fixed points, none of them would be isolated. But you don't even have to have a, a plane of fixed points. None of them would be isolated. But you can have these other things, like I was just trying to indicate, that you could have a fixed point, and then you could have a sequence of fixed points that is marching towards it and you know, getting arbitrarily close to it. But this, there's not a whole continuum like a line. But still, even if you had this pretty bizarre thing, um, you could cook up examples that will do this by thinking about sine waves, for instance, that oscillate faster and faster, like, I don't know, what? Like sine of 1 over x or something like that. Maybe x times sine 1 over x, or some number of powers of x times sine 1 over x will do something like this. 
And then the origin in that example, or at least this point in, in general, this would not be an isolated fixed point for such an example. Okay, anyway, so we, we do need this, and you'll see where in the, the proof sketch why we need this. So suppose we have an isolated, by the way, this is typical. I mean, isolated fixed points are the common kind. It's rare to get anything else. Anyway, so suppose we have an isolated fixed point in this 2D conservative system. Now, for the important condition, if that fixed point is a local min or a local max of this function e, um, doesn't matter actually, it could be a min or a max. If it's either of those, um, then x star is a center. That is to say that the all trajectories sufficiently close to x star are closed. Okay, so that's the statement. And um, so if you want to try to visualize what's being talked about, uh, I mean, take the example that's above here. Here we have a, an isolated fixed point. It's, um, it is a local min of some conserved you know, quantity E, which is that thing that we've been talking about earlier. And boom, it's automatically a center. We didn't even need to calculate the, you know, and we didn't need to discuss the shapes of the level sets of E. So let's just think about why, though. Here's the, the idea of the proof. This can be made rigorous, but I'll, let me indicate the one place where it's a little bit loose. So the idea is, um, OK, well, E is constant on trajectories. That's the, what we get automatically for, with a conserved quantity. And so the um, trajectories lie in the contours of E. That is, what I'm saying is any trajectory is a subset of a contour of the function E. It's, it's contained in a level set of E. Now, why am I saying it like that, contained in a level set? Why isn't it the whole level set? Um, it might be the whole level set, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, that is, like, take the example of a homoclinic orbit, like up here. Um, the, traje the trajectory here, or maybe I should look down here, this trajectory you know, we said goes how? I think it goes this way from here around and then asymptotically approaches this point and, and you know, sort of stops. That is not the whole contour. The whole contour is, is this plus this other half of the figure eight. So, um, so we don't automatically get the whole contour, but the trajectories do live, as this one does, inside the contour. All right, so we have that. But now, what about, where are we using the max and min? Well, um, the next point is that the contours are closed curves. Um, near a minimum or a maximum. And by that, I just mean, I guess I would want to appeal to your, your geometric intuition. Um, take a, you know, a curve, uh, take a surface that has a local min. I think you can believe that if I cut through there with a plane, a horizontal plane, that that's going to slice off a closed curve. But that re would require proof. So if you're really doing this carefully, this is the statement that you'd have to prove. Uh, you could do it with the implicit function theorem, I think. But this is not that kind of course. So just I hope you can see that um, it will be true.
but when you're near a max or a min. And so the final thing is that um, the, well, so the, the tr that is, the fixed point was, so to speak, down here, but this uh, then corresponds to the energy for that one. What's the obstacle? What, we're trying to show that these trajectories are actually closed trajectories. They go all the way around the closed curve. So how could they fail? Let me finish. How could they fail? Um, how could they fail? How could, they, how could this trajectory that lies inside this closed contour, what could go wrong to prevent it from being a closed trajectory? Yes? So the concern is, you say, if there were a saddle point on that trajectory, or actually any fixed point on that trajectory, then um, that would prevent us from going all the way around. And also, well, that's, that's really it. I mean, if there were any fixed point on that trajectory, that would cause trouble. But how do we know there isn't any fixed point on that trajectory, on that contour? That's the isolated condition, right? That we said sufficiently close to this this um, fixed point, there's some disk where there are no other fixed points in that disk. So that means that the closed contour, any closed contour surrounding that, doesn't have any fixed points on it. And therefore, you could just go around and around. So that, that's the gist of the proof. That's where you need the isolatedness condition. OK, now, did you have a question or comment? I'm sorry, could you speak up a little? How could we have an isolated fixed point that's not a local min or max? Um, it could happen by being a saddle point of the surface. So for example, this, this is an isolated fixed point here. But remember, it's not a local min or max of the energy surface because it's a saddle point of the energy surface. And so near that, um, you know, that is not surrounded by closed curves. So that's the, that's the thing. That's why you want a local min or max. By the way, I showed it for a local min, but you know, of course, for a local max, it's going to be the same picture that when you cut through there, you're going to get closed curves. OK, let's move on to uh, another example then. And that is the classic problem of the pendulum, which you all heard about in, I don't know, certainly in elementary physics. And then there's that chicken-hearted move of you know, the small angle approximation. <laughs> so now we're going to be muscular and, and not do that using our technology and see what's the real deal with the pendulum. I mean, what, what really happens? Well, um, let me write it in a dimensionless form. That is, let's ignore the, the length of the pendulum and the gravitational acceleration just to get at the essence of what's going on. It's, it would be um, theta double dot plus sine theta is 0. And we're not assuming any damping or driving. This is just still within the framework we've been talking about. Now let's let um, v, or I guess I could call it omega, really, but I'll, I'll refer to it as v. Let's let v be theta dot. So that's the angular velocity. And then um, v dot, which is theta double dot, will be negative sine theta. So there's our two-dimensional system. Um, theta dot is v, v dot is minus sine theta. And then calculating the Jacobian for that, we would get um, where I'll do the thetas first. So d theta dot d theta, d theta dot dv, dv dot d theta, 
dv dot dv, we'll get 0, 1, negative cosine theta, and 0. And if you ask what are the fixed points for this, well, v has to be 0, and sine theta has to be 0, which occurs at places like 0 or pi or 2 pi or whatever. Integer multiples of pi. Um, OK, so let's look at, say, the 0, 0, that fixed point. Then you get 0 in the Jacobian. Um, a will be 0, 1. Negative cosine of 0, that's negative 1, 0. And that has a trace of 0 and a determinant of 1, which tells us that we're having a linear center. But you can check, maybe I'll skip some of the details, that um, this is a conservative system also. No kidding, I mean, it looks like it, it fits in the earlier discussion. And that E is um, half V squared minus cosine theta. That's a conserved quantity. That's constant. And this has a local min at the point 0, 0. So in fact, this linear center um, is actually a true center. That is, it's a nonlinear center at 0, 0. Which corresponds to what you already know physically, that a pendulum where um, the theta equals 0 corresponds to the downward position, that's a stable point. It's just going to oscillate in small oscillations around that. Yes? I have to ask, is the fixed point a local min or a local max of the energy function? So in this case, you could do it this way. You could say um, the, the energy function E, you know, if I expand it near um, 0, 0, the half V squared is fine the way it is. That's the leading order behavior in V. But cosine of theta near 0 is, um, you might remember the expansion, cosine of theta is 1 minus theta squared over 2 factorial, which is 2 plus dot, dot, dot. Right, so that's the, the, the um, approximation to the energy function. So when I subtract that, I'd have minus 1 minus theta squared over 2 plus higher order terms. And that thing is 1 half um, v squared plus theta squared, you know, plus a constant plus additional terms that are negligible. But just stare at this object. This, this thing has a function of v and theta, can you see, is a, is a parabola opening upward. Not parabola, paraboloid, right? It's a surface. v squared plus theta squared has a local min at theta equals v equals 0. So that's how you check it. You, you, since we have a local min, we're invoking this earlier theorem. That's a nonlinear center. Is there another question? Yes? For, uh, for these conservative systems, yes, you want to calculate the energy function. And then you want to see if you have, for any centers, you want to find out if they're true centers by doing this, qu this kind of thing we just did. Do you have a local min or max at the, the center in question? So is it the energy isn't like true energy? If the energy is not true energy, then we're not dealing with a conservative system. What's the question? You mean if it's not a, oh, it's a conserved quantity but doesn't have the physical interpretation of energy? Yes, it's okay. Everything we said still works. How do you derive that conserved quantity? Oh, how would you derive a conserved quantity in a non-mechanical system? Ah, right. So there will be some homework examples like that um, where I'll suggest various tricks. So the trick of, there's often a trick. Yeah, you have to monkey around with it. There isn't a universal technology for finding conserve quantities. But, but there are various tricks that often work. So yes, I'll show you some. Um, but OK, so let's polish off the pendulum here. We've got 
So we do have this center at 0, 0. But the other point um, that we have to think about you know, physically would correspond to the inverted pendulum. This is the pendulum standing straight up, which you kind of expect won't be stable. And it's not. So that is, I mean, maybe I should, be, should have drawn the coordinate system. It wasn't, I, I, I mean, there's a standard one. I'm thinking of the pendulum like this with theta defined this way. Um, zero being the downward position. OK, so anyway, theta equals pi would be the pendulum standing inverted. And um, if you look at v equals 0, theta star equals, let's call it pi, then what? Then I would get Jacobian is 0, 1. Cosine of pi is negative 1, but there's a negative sign, so it's plus 1, 0. And this is going to give us a saddle. OK, so checking out the, um, the shape of the energy function or, or looking at the eigenvectors about the, um, in the neighborhood of the different fixed points, you can arrive at a picture like this. That near the origin, actually, let's just look at this. This calculation with the energy shows us that the um, contours near 0, 0 are actually circles, right? Because v squared plus theta squared equals constant. That's a circle. So near the origin, the contours are, in fact, close to perfectly circular. They, they start getting deformed away from circular as you go farther out. Um, if we go to something like pi, then we're going to have saddle behavior here and here. This is an unstable point. It's a saddle point. And then there's a corresponding one at negative pi, um, which you know physically is the same state. It's still the inverted pendulum. So let's draw that. And we can also remark that, um, remember, our system is theta dot equals v. v dot is minus sine theta. So again, to put the arrows on, you observe that when v is positive, here's v, here's theta. When v is positive, theta dot is positive, which means we're pointing to the right. So all these arrows are going like this in the upper half plane. And um, in the lower half plane, the opposite. They're all pointing to the left. Um, and this also, it turns out, has a homoclinic orbit. Ah, maybe we better be a little careful. That is, you can imagine the pendulum standing straight up. And then, you know, hard to think about this, actually. Imagine just slightly away from straight up. Then it could go all the way around and maybe just asymptotically approach the top and stop, if you got it just right. And so that, that will give us a trajectory on this picture that looks like so. Where I, I hesitated to call it homoclinic. Why didn't I want to call it homoclinic? It's not the same fixed point. This point, as a, regarded as a, in, the, in the plane, is a different point from that point. Right? On the other hand, in physical terms, it's the same state. You're still an inverted pendulum. So, the, but the technical word for this, where you would go from one saddle point to another saddle point, that's called a heteroclinic orbit. Hetero meaning different, right? Homo the same. So a heteroclinic orbit is one of these that connects two different saddle points like so. Sometimes people call it a saddle connection for that reason. And then there's the symmetric version of it down here. Um, and then we can fill in the rest of the phase portrait, which will look you know, like this. And so we've pretty much solved the whole pendulum problem by drawing this sort of diagram. Now, what does it mean physically? Um, can we give an interpretation? That is, uh, let's get our bodies limbered up again. Suppose that the system was moving 
according to this trajectory up here, the, the one that's highest up. What would that mean the pendulum was doing? Okay, yes, I saw you doing it. Going like that, it's whirling, right? It's whirling over the top. How can I see that? Theta is just increasing monotonically, which is what this motion is doing. This motion down here, where we're going this way, theta is again moving monotonically, but in the opposite sense. So that's going the other way. These kind of motions down here are confined to the neighborhood of the downward position. These are small oscillations, the ones that people study in, in the freshman physics course. So this is where you've linearized around the bottom. Okay, But even if you move away from that and allow more substantial oscillations, they're still just doing that, nothing mysterious. And then in between are these homoclinic, or I should say heteroclinic trajectories that go around and then just sort of at infinite time stop at the top. And that's it. Um, I mean, the thing that you don't get from the traditional linear analysis is you never see the pendulum going over the top, which now we can see. The last thing I guess I want to say is that um, earlier where I was sputtering about is it heteroclinic, is it homoclinic, that's because there's a natural uh, phase space for this, which is not the plane. It's sort of more tempting to think of this theta as being the same as that theta because they're the same physical state, right? I mean, there's no real difference between negative pi and pi as far as the pendulum is concerned. So for this reason, people often draw a picture where they, um, or I mean, to say it another way, because we have two pi periodicity in the whole picture in the theta direction, let us, um, if we regard all thetas mod 2 pi, then the plane becomes a cylinder. Where all I mean by that is, if you think of this piece of paper as the plane, and I think of this edge at negative pi as being the same as this edge at positive pi, they're the same. So put them together, and now it's a cylinder. So that's a really the, sort of the physically correct phase space for the pendulum. Um, that is, it's a different two-dimensional manifold. It's, it's a cylinder, not a plane. And so it's interesting to draw the, the phase portrait on the cylinder. Instead, um, you'd have something that looks, say, like this. Um, I'll draw the, not completely, I won't put the two edges of the paper completely together so that you can sort of still see the difference. Um, so this is supposed to be the paper curled around, almost touching itself, and theta is going around, well, maybe I should make it a little rounder looking down here. Um, theta is going this way, and theta equals pi is sort of around here. And theta equals zero is kind of over here. And so what has happened is that the saddle point has kind of gotten carved in half. Um, there's a trajectory coming out like this and like that. And then here going on to the back of the cylinder. I won't try to show the back. But you know, you're going something like this. And over here is the, or approximately here, is the, the center where we've got these trajectories like that. And then the whirling motions are these up here, going this way, and then up and around. Well, that, I ran out of room. But um, do you see what I'm trying to show? That is, you can the point is you can really see there's a topological difference between the two types of periodic motion. The periodic motion that is just a little closed orbit around this point, that just lives sort of on a piece of the cylinder that is, the thing is it does not encircle the cylinder the way a belt encircles your body. So the whirling motions have this different topological characteristic. They, in, they go around the circle this way just to say that they keep increasing monotonically in their theta. 
Um, and so this representation, this cylindrical phase space, brings that out more clearly in some ways than, than this picture. Any question then about this? Yes? A physical example of a heteroclinic orbit where you move from one saddle point to another, where it's not kind of just a trivial thing like that we're just giving two different names to the same state. Um, there, there certainly are. I'm trying to think what would be a good example to give you. Um, I mean, they come up, this, this is a little too far afield maybe for you, but there are some problems where you analyze waves where there's a, a soliton-like object like this where you have some kind of thing that is at this type of state, then it makes a sharp transition, and then it has another state. And maybe this wave is moving, you know, like that. Or could th so when you sometimes when you have a partial differential equation with a wave solution, and you look for a wave solution by doing the thing where you would say, you know, x is, uh, sorry, there's some function of some I don't know, like u is a function of x minus c t something moving at speed c. So you, you pop this into the partial differential equation. When you look for these wave-like objects, you can often reduce the PDE to um, an ordinary differential equation. And then when you're looking for states of this type, waves of this type, they're going to have the property that out at this wave variable, call it xi, when xi is plus infinity, that's sort of out here. And xi equals negative infinity, that's out here. And you're looking for something which is flat. That is to say, as you go to negative infinity, it's kind of like going to negative infinite time. You have one state, and at positive infinite time, you have another. Maybe that was too fancy of an example. But, but yes, we absolutely do look for heteroclinic orbits um, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, maybe I can try to think of a simpler example for you for next time. OK, thanks. So see you next time. And there's also homeworks to be picked up if you didn't yet. Yeah.